First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us at this CL keynote. Our panelists will present and share their insights and perspective about how the CIO role involves in this cloud and mobile computing environment. So now, let me introduce our moderator for today, David Kingston, the Managing Director of Corporate Executive Board. David, your time. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope the tent wasn't too soggy. And uh, welcome back. You know, it was interesting listening to the CEO and the academic panel sort of paint this exciting tableau about the potential and understanding that a lot of the CIOs and, and practitioners in the room were probably about ready to rise up and say, that's great, hallelujah, but, um, you know, we live in a real world, we have large installed base of technology, we need to figure out how to transition from that environment to the potential that cloud and mobility brings to us here today. I was, for one, especially excited because I knew that we were going to follow um, with the uh, gentleman that we have up here on, the, on stage with me and really be able to, to show you some concrete examples of what people are doing today with cloud and mobility and then dig in on the real challenges that we as IT leaders face in making the value potential a reality. Often we find ourselves too focused on the technology. Um, and the technology challenges are real, make no mistake. But our industry, the creativity of the individuals who work in IT have enabled us to overcome technology challenges again and again and again. And this will most likely be the case here in cloud mobility. But the management challenges, the leadership challenges, how we understand what is the value that we want to extract, how we think about the human factors that we need to drive change in large organizations, and then where we want to focus from an innovation standpoint. Is it at the level of the individual knowledge worker? Is it at the level of disruptive business models? Where do we as IT leaders want to truly drive the ball forward is, I think, the conversation we'd very much like to have up here today. Now, I'm going to try to chalk the field just a little bit. I'm not going to give you a definition of cloud, um, but I am going to say that we are going to talk private, hybrid, public. That's where the most interesting and exciting stuff is happening, so we're going to use that as a starting point. We're certainly not just talking about compute power. We're going to look at the issues of storage um, and networking as well. Um, and what we'd like to do is really focus in on those leadership issues, those leadership challenges. And again, I'm going to argue that we should bucket those in where are we extracting the value, the human factors, how are we leading change, and then focus in on the innovation components. Where are we looking to drive real innovation? You all know the gentlemen who are here on stage. Rather than spend any time introducing them, you can read their bios. What I'm going to suggest is each of them give us a 90-second overview of either one exciting thing that they're doing in the cloud and or how they're thinking about capturing the value of the cloud in their organization. Anthony, let me start with you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Gl uh, great to be here. Um, global Crossing, the company that I work for uh, presently, we're a global IP services provider. Um, mostly uh, layer one through three services, extensive subsea and terrestrial network uh, with a big bunch of data center infrastructure on top of that for managed hosting and private cloud. I share that with you because I'm going to share an anecdote um, that uh, my team often reminds me, which is, uh, you may have heard the term drinking one's own champagne or eating one's own dog food, depending on your orientation. Prefer the uh, first. But we prefer the first, <laughs> obviously. But uh, I like to think that um, if something is not good enough for us, it's certainly not good enough for our customers. Um, and, and with that, let me, let me just uh, give you a, a, a little bit of background on what we're doing in our company today. So I've got about 60% of my global applications running in our own private cloud. We, uh, have adopted a best-of-breed approach. We use a number of software as a service providers. Um, I mentioned we have 60% of our applications in the cloud today, our private cloud. 90% um, of all new work goes into that private cloud. Um, not because I force people, um, not because my team forces people, but because it works. And uh, the story that I want to share with you, the example that relates to if, if it's good enough for us, 
we believe it's good enough for our customers, um, has to do with communications in the cloud. Mm. Um, you know, we're, as, as David said, we'll spend time today talking about the continuum of compute, network, communication, storage, et cetera. Um, about a year ago, uh, we believe that there was tremendous value in placing certain communications and collaboration functions in the cloud. So we moved something very simple, and it should be known to all of us, our audio conferencing bridges into our enterprise network and put them in a hosting zone. And we anchored them in our global enterprise network, our SIP network, and that's also inside of our MPLS network. Um, three things occurred as a result of that. And again, we're only talking about plain vanilla audio conferencing at this point in time. Number one, the user experience, and I'm going to come back to that multiple times, the quality of experience improved because we were able to be very deterministic about what that user was experiencing in that cloud-based offer because they were on net. Number two, um, in the proof of concept, we had suggested that we could save roughly 30%, and we would save that money by removing costs from our supply chain. I've been running this now in our own enterprise for about six months, and we're clocking at about 25%. Don't tell my CFO that he doesn't know. I'm banking the savings, okay? Um, the third thing, though, is that uh, it's become a platform. That basic connectivity to a premise that we can be deterministic about is now a platform for other IT services that we can put inside of that in a hosted communications model. And I'm referring to IM, presence, directory services, telephony, et cetera. So I wanted to share that with you um, as, a, uh, as an example of drinking one's own champagne. Um, it, it tastes pretty good now. Um, and then back to the point about uh, if it's good enough for us, uh, we hope it's good enough for our customers. Um, that concept has been productized and it is being moved through the product organizations today. So I wanted to share that with you as an example and uh, look forward to the follow-up questions. Excellent. Mark, an example of the cloud. Yeah, uh, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity. At, um, at VMware, I mean, we're all about speed and agility. So the thing that we've been able to do is we have a very uh, highly virtualized environment. And over the past year, we've been able to deliver 39 tier one projects um, in, in a year. 87% of those were um, on schedule and all within our project uh, budgets. So an example of this would be like business intelligence. You know, we were able to roll this out. The business case for that was $350 million incremental revenue over three years, as well as $7 million uh, of savings. So it's just kind of the example of some of the things that we were able to do at, uh, at VMware, because it's all about speed and agility. How can I get more things done in a much shorter time frame? Sanjay. I'm just going to say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. But um, again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so our, our journey to the cloud, if you would, was really around choice. Um, and it goes back to late 2004, early 2005. And the point there was, if our internal users had a choice, would they come back to us as a, as a, as a provider? And you know, that, sort of, that was the litmus test. That was the question that we asked ourselves all the time to keep ourselves honest. And what that led to was um, the same challenges that, that many of you may have in your organizations back then, which was growth, uh, global footprint, uh, a distributed workforce, so things that were, you know, and acquisitions, and, and we, had to, we had to get agile, to, to, to Mark's point. And, um, and we started out with a journey in virtualization mm -hmm. that drove efficiency, which quickly turned into journey to cloud, which drove quality of service across the business, and which is, quick, which is rapidly, and, and this compression in timeframes, uh, turned into agility for us, and that's the, that's the path we're on right now. Um, which, which will hopefully drive uh, a cloud architecture. It's not so much cloud per se, but cloud architecture across the business. So that's sort of been our journey. Happy to dive into details. Excellent, excellent. Tassos. Yes, um, we, we had a similar story. We're a global company, 
And um, we use different strategy for our cloud. Some of our, uh, you know, for our internal needs. Some of the applications, we host them within our own private cloud. But also we use some of the uh, service providers. And it depends if in terms of the solutions we want to provide uh, for our internal customers. Especially we have some small, small countries that we have put them in a ERP kind of cloud outside of uh, our own company. And then for uh, solutions that we create for our own customers, we use our own uh, cloud where we provide the kind of a private cloud services for uh, information management. So I heard a couple of things in there. I certainly heard cost and efficiency, quality of service, um, and agility come through. If you were in one of the organizations represented in the room today, and you were trying to make the case um, internally to make a major move in the direction of the cloud, would you drive one part of that equation harder than the other? Is it really about agility, and that's the thing that you think is going to capture the attention of your partners, or is it a question of cost? I could, I could take a stab at that. Please. Uh, it's, I think it starts out, quite honestly, with efficiency. You can gain a lot of efficiency by, by consolidation, by doing the things that the underpinnings of cloud architecture within your organization, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about private cloud at this point. And so the underpinnings being deep degrees of virtualization across, across the, uh, the enterprise. That leads quickly to a quality of service equation, which in mm -hmm. turn leads to agility. So it's not sequential necessarily, but that's, there's a logical flaw in my opinion. OK, OK. Please, Anthony. I, I, uh, David, I think it depends on what you're trying to get done. Um, I think. Um, Leading with efficiency while, while key, um, there needs to be something that precedes that. What is the business problem we're trying to solve? Um, you know, do I have you know, multiple pools of developers vying for scarce resources for a proof of concept that they believe is going to outdo another one? Wouldn't it be great to be able to do two or three for the price of one? I think it just comes back to mm -hmm. what problem it is you're trying to solve. So I would just suggest that precedes that question. It's interesting, though, if you and remember back to conversations that I was having with folks, say, you know, five to seven years ago, um, when they were driving, just starting at server virtualization, and right. the case was efficiency, efficiency, efficiency. I'm going you know, to reduce boxes, hardware costs go down, life's going to be good. And they failed to put governance in place, and they had image proliferation um, and an explosion of, of human costs. Um, uh, hardware costs went down, but they had an explosion of human costs. And in the end, if you go back, you said, did you get money out? They would say, well, probably not as much as I expected. In fact, maybe not that much overall. But the agility was mm. huge. And the business case I'm making today is on the agility. So as we think about sort of an extension into broader cloud, not just the servers, but in a broader cloud, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not we should be leading more with the agility and recognize it on the back end. Of course, we're always going to do costs, right? There isn't a CIO in this room who isn't worried about trying to figure out how to both you know, reduce the capital component um, and drive down the costs associated with our underlying infrastructure. But is it the agility play that really is going to capture the attention of our partners? I don't know. What do you yeah, think? Maybe I'll, I'll start there. I mean, we, we think of um, the journey in three phases. You know, the first one is that you become familiar with the technology. And I think that there are savings. And we should just do that, you know, as an IT organization. I mean, I think it's our job to run very efficient organizations. But you also want to do it in something that, um, you know, isn't going to put the business at risk. But that's sort of the fir first phase. And then you, in the second phase, you're starting to use your mission-critical applications. You're rolling your email, your CRM, and so forth. You're going to save money there, but you're actually going to start moving you know, much faster in, in, that, in that second phase. And then the third is, is all about agility. It's speed. So you don't want to let go of those savings. You want to have the you know, governance processes in place so you're not wasting resources. It is resources when you provision a VM and, and, and so forth. But, it, but you, know, you really want to get to that speed. I mean, all of us are asked to be doing more, more with less. You know, we, we want to get to the, to the point where you know, we're the real enablers of our businesses. How can we help build products faster? How can we you know, give back time to our sales organizations and our R&D organizations? So I think it's just across those, those sort of three phases, if you will. But I think cost, we want to be mindful of all those. But we also have to be, you know, there, there's some experimenting, if you will, with, I'll say, any new technology. Mm. And that's where in that first phase, you just want to kind of figure it out and maybe, you know, get some of your governance processes in place so you don't get the, uh, the sprawl. But we ultimately want to be in that agility because my enemy is time. I've got lots of things I have to get done in a very, very short time frame. As you think about the question of sort of public, hybrid, private, and the desire to move forward now. Um, is the private the place that we should be experimenting? 
and then moving into the public? Can we leapfrog over private and go right to public? Tell us as you're thinking about where you're making investments today and the share of sort of things that might be in the public cloud versus things that yeah, today so, are, are in private. So it, it depends. I mean, things that they have to do with our customer data and so on, uh, we decide to use a lot of the private cloud. Yeah. Uh, but there is a lot of best-in-class uh, applications in public clouds. So for those best-in-class, we decided it's more effective to move them there. It just provides very quick solutions for our for the business. Mm -hmm. In some cases, though, it does not mean is the least expensive. So this is one of the things that uh, I always struggle with, manage cost, and at the same time provide some of these new solutions. Mm -hmm. So one of the, it uh, quickly comes up when you start talking public and private, often is a question of it's not the system, but it's the data. Um, and how do I think about interoperability of data across my various systems? Uh, Salesforce.com um, was mentioned a couple of times today, and I can't tell you the number of times I've had conversations where, yes, the front end is great, and it's very easy for people to use, and there's great excitement about that, other than the comments that were made earlier. But the work that we need to do on the API on, on, on the back end and making sure that we get the integration correct so that we can take full advantage of the suite of potential there is a great challenge and certainly something we as, as IT leaders, and if you had the architects in the room, they would be going. Um, great great uh, guns on this particular issue is very important. Sanjay, as you think about sort of the, the question of data and data interoperability of data, where, where, where do you think people should be looking today for experimentation and value capture? This is an evolution. So, you know, as much as the, you look at the best of breed, like Tasso said, best of breed applications that may be available in the public cloud that you want to avail of, you know, especially in large enterprises, you, you, you also want to make sure that th those, those applications don't run in isolation. Mm. So if it's a CRM application, there's linkages back to your ERP systems, there's linkages back to other systems within the organization. So the data has to flow back and forth. So it's not about either or. There, you know, and, and today it may be a little harder than it needs to be. But the evolution clearly is that there'll be much more seamless connections, data connect, connectivity between public um, and private architectures. Mm -hmm. So that is generally the direction. But you, it's hard to it's hard to fight the value that some of these, um, you know, these applications in the cloud bring today. And mm -hmm. and if they fit the size and type of organization that you are, um, you know, you wouldn't be doing a whole lot of service by not looking at them. Yeah. You looking to come in there, Anthony? Yeah, I am. I, I think um, I absolutely agree with, with how Sanjay depicted that. It's not an either or, it's both. And uh, I mean, to be, to be very crisp about this, the further abstraction of technology is just not going to happen without the evolution of standards. All right? And it's a question of, of not if, but when. And uh, I happen to be sitting on the stage right now with a number of you know, very, very powerful companies that you know, are going to evolve that. So. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think a, an analogy to keep in mind here is look at, um, and we were talking about this earlier, look at uh, SS7 signaling networks, look at, you know, uh, standards forums for intelligent networking, look at domain name services, look at the evolution of the internet as we know it today, um, and, and the role that standards played in making that utility and allowing us to abstract further value from it. I think the same thing's going to happen here. Okay, so where we look for those standards and how we drive those standards is very important. Let's talk a bit about the human factors component, because I, I, I set up at the beginning that this was probably less a technology question and more a question of behavior. Um, and I want to start at the, at the level of sort of our business partners, and then we'll dig in to talk about individual knowledge workers themselves. But as you think about your business partners, what are, what are behavioral changes that they either need to adopt or that the cloud accelerates them adopting um, internally? Think about conversations you've been having. Who, who do you need to be changing their mind, and what are you trying to change? Mark, let's sure, start with yeah, you. I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot. I mean, I, I think we have a much more sophisticated um, a business community that we're dealing with, and they have choices. So I think in the past, I mean, we could have the monopoly of IT, and if you want something, you have to kind of come to us. Well, that's all gone. I mean, you have SaaS applications, you've got these mobile devices and so forth. So I think what we have to do is we have to accept that the world is, is, is changing here. And, um, you know, if you, if you think of it in kind of three layers, there's the whole end user side where device of choice, it's going to change tomorrow. And we've got to get out of the position of saying, no, you can't use this device. In the application layer, you're going to have legacy apps, which you want, they're not going to go away. So you want to optimize those, maybe replatform them, you know, get them on virtualization to, to get the most value out of those. But we've got to get in that area, how can we get more modern apps? You know, that we have the Facebook, the Twitter, and so forth. So we get away from that Soviet era interfaces that you have in many of these applications. 
And then finally, at the, at the, at the bottom level, you've got the, your infrastructure, and you figure out how can you um, optimize that between private cloud and public cloud and so forth. But I think where we add the most value is all in that applications. How can we as IT professionals get better applications out to our businesses so that they can get their jobs uh, done quicker? Mm -hmm. And I think that the, you know, the, the monopoly of IT is over. <laughs> it's out there, and we just have to mm -hmm. accept this new world. And there's enormous opportunities, the things that we can do as IT professionals that we couldn't have in the past, and we can do it much faster than we uh, could uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Please. I was just going to say, you know, I think it's where we've, we've op we're, we're down the path of optimizing IT production. Mm -hmm. Now it's all about business consumption. How does the business consume what we produce, right? Mm -hmm. So we, if, we, if we abstract away the conversations that the business love to have with us, what is it running on? Where does it run? Which data center is it in? How much space does it take? They love to have those conversations. And we've, mm -hmm. got to take, we've taken that off the table. So now what we're talking about is the business capabilities that they want. How do they consume the stuff that we've built already? Mm -hmm. So that's a very different conversation. Said differently, you have to get, you, we have to, IT and the business, IT is as guilty of this as anyone else, mm -hmm. has to get away from the project conversation to the capabilities conversation, to the mm -hmm. service consumption conversation. Right. And that is the cultural transformation that we have to make within the business, or else you keep going back to project, which means more silos, which means more. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we take steps back. doesn't matter how much you optimize. Mm -hmm. If the conversation doesn't change, in my opinion, we're sort of regressing a little bit. As you think about services in, 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 in your organization, well, what I tell my team is they have to lead the change. You know, we cannot be in the back of the bus, mm. right? So we have to be more proactive and almost challenge the business with some of the changes. Uh, I think it's critical. I mean, what happens a lot of times, you know, you, you do have, you know, the business has sold certain solutions. And uh, my view is we have to lead them. We have to be able to, you know, we understand some of the complexities. Uh, the cloud is not going to solve all of the complexities that we have, and we need to be upfront there and helping the business move through the change. I think that's very critical from the mobile environment to the application space. I heard the point earlier when you were talking about sort of new work going into the cloud, but let's talk about the legacy migration challenge a little bit, because in the end, if we're not able to, either through our services approach or other approaches, migrate out of our legacy environments, um, then we've got a very interesting shiny penny conversation, but we've got a whole lot of cost that we're going to be stranded with. How are folks thinking about legacy migration? So I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, I, Again, I, I come back to business rules. Um, I, I'm not going to let myself, my team, my organization become infatuated with the topic because, you know, company X has decided to do that. I think it's situation specific. If we've got a legacy application that we've had in place and there's a lot of human capital tied up in, in it and a number of very specific features that would be hard to port into any cloud, um, I'm going to try to sweat that asset as long as I possibly can, mm -hmm. as long as I'm not doing damage to my business. Now, um, where that gets interesting is with uh, inorganic activity, M&A activity, um, the end of an investment cycle, or, for example, a large customer that suddenly wants us to do business in a different way. So, you know, I, I, think, I think that that agility is critical, but also that need to be flexible, you know, but you know, I kind of start with, with where are you and how much more can you get out of this before you need to move. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a view of that is, um, you know, in some cases it does not pay off to migrate legacy applications. Right. Actually, in most cases, it's kind of be very hard. So what you don't want to do, though, is you don't want to give them to the business, right? So you want to give access to the business in a different way so they don't even know that there is a legacy application behind that. Uh, so you integrate it through web services or other things, uh, and you, you, know, you make it very current to the business, and you meet the business needs without investing a lot of capital in migrating it. Mm -hmm. As you think about um, developers and, and either, either folks who are bringing packages into your environment that you're customizing and or work that you might be doing new development in your environment, some of us still do that. Um, how important are the self-service aspects 
of cloud to them. So I've heard a number of folks say, I can put a cloud in place, but I'm not going to change my provisioning model because that's part of my governance structure, and this, all this self-service stuff really isn't all that important. And then other people have said, no, you've got to get the self-service right. If you don't get the self-service right, it's not perceived as a cloud, and you, you won't get the, uh, the uptake that you're looking for. Sanjay, does that resonate we're with you? We're in the throes of this right now, okay. and we support a fairly technical internal community. You know, a lot of developers and uh, field engineers, et cetera. So they want self-service. So it's a function, I think, of the organization you support as well. Mm -hmm. And in this case, infrastructure as a service, you know, we want to make this as self-sufficient as you as as, as uh, uh, cataloged as you can, IT mm -hmm. as a service. And, and we want to step away from having to provision anything. Why do we need to provision stuff when it can be automated? Mm -hmm. So if you can standardize, you can automate. And then, you know, move up the chain. So platforms as a service. So a lot of folks use different images of databases, middleware, tools that we spend a lot of time helping them get to. Well, we don't need to anymore. That they, you know, what needs to work behind this is levels of automation that you can actually bring these horizontal services out to, the, uh, to your internal community. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's how we're looking at it. I, I think that there's foundational attributes, and, and they're almost definitional. Automation is one, multi-tenancy is another, orchestration of back-end services is, is yet another. Um, you know, and I would add a previous question to that as well, um, and make it explicit, which is easy to consume. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've had to do a number of things with applications that our businesses suggested they wanted, um, in order to get them to consume more easily. Um, I go back to the case in point that I shared earlier, the hosted communications offer. We had to develop a mobile app competency um, inside of our IT shop to be able to launch these sessions from a PDA, you know, because there were individuals that were driving and they were trying to key in a bunch of, you know, different numbers. And so we decided, you know, hey, somebody came up with the idea, why don't we just embed this in, into Outlook and allow someone to press a single button, and you know, voila, we saw consumption increase. So I would add that to it as well. Yeah, the, the, let, let, let's go from that, and you were talking about an individual knowledge worker who's trying to make a phone call, um, hopefully with their hands-free device. The, the, let's talk about, though, ease of use and embedding it in workflow. What other examples mm -hmm. of ways that you might be, again, leveraging cloud and mobility to drive innovation in your organizations at the level of the individual knowledge worker. So that was one great example. Are there others um, up here on the panel that you'd like to, yeah. to bring forward, Mark, as you think about that? Uh, my, as, as far as um, you know, the, the individual, I mean, I just think of um, you know, maybe we, we had a uh, replacement of a support system you know, and we uh, had an existing application that we could have chose to upgrade or we uh, could have went into the cloud, you know, with, with a uh, provider. And what we uh, determined there is, is that the functionality of the existing system was higher. You know, there was clearly they had more functionality, but the user interface was horrible. Mm. So um, what we ended up doing is we opted for the cloud solution, and um, the adoption was very high. You know, everyone uh, really, uh, really liked it. And then once on that platform, we were able to make changes, you know, much faster. So I think, um, you know, if we get back to that, um, that knowledge worker, they want things that are kind of easier to use. And, it, you know, you, you, how can we take that consumer experience back into the enterprise? Because, um, you know, some of these, um, you know, these applications are anything but, um, but intuitive. But in, in this uh, support example, um, you know, the business leader said, this is the, the solution I want. I know my staff will use it. I know that they can be, um, you know, more productive. And we will quickly catch up, you know, because I now have, I'm on a different platform that I can, that I can um, you know, build on much, much faster than I, I could have in the past. How much of the innovation do you think, actually, that we get out of the cloud enabled and mobile and mobility enabled is going to come in the form of business model disruption versus individual knowledge workers being able to make better decisions or work more effectively. If you think about where you're placing your innovation bets, how much is it the level of the enterprise versus at the level of the individual? Tassos, mm -hmm. where, would you, where would you come down on that? Yeah, I, I think we're, we're focusing on both, you know, definitely focusing on the enterprise especially in terms of the, sa the sales force and resources around that and what solutions we provide them. And then we look into the individual, and clearly the individual is changing. Mm. Uh, you know, definitely I'm a baby, you know, a baby boomer, but I still, you know, 
like to use a lot of the new technologies. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what I mean by leading a lot of that as an IT team, where instead of the business and the resources uh, driving us into using those solutions, we're actually enabling them, the team, to use the solutions so they can become more efficient. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have, let's say, one specific mobile device anymore in the office, but you can use your device of preference and you'll be able to have access of things, but still manage it in a secure way mm -hmm. that meet the enterprise needs. That's what the flexibility we have to get into mm -hmm. in order to meet the, the new generations and really the business. Yeah, and, and, and just to be clear, we were, we were all laughing um, uh, together as a group uh, during the CIO panel and sort of the baby boomer, I mean, the, uh, the Gen X, Gen Y, and baby boomers. Certainly our research, when we look at where early adopters are in your organization, it cuts across all mm -hmm. socioeconomic and age levels. And the power of that resource of experimentation used safely is just an amazing potential that exists today. Right. I mean, no IT organization, regardless of its scale, would be able to muster that level of sort of pilots and support. So if we can figure out how to identify those early adopters and then channel their learning in an effective way and broaden it out across the organization, there's real potential there. I see you're nodding your head. It's, I think it's happening regardless of you know, how the enterprise thinks about it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just take the device proliferation, okay. that is happening regardless, I think Mark said it earlier, it's, it's, it's gonna happen. It's happening around us. The, so you either harness it, or you have to spend a lot of time fighting it. And I think it brings productivity. Be, you know, individuals, myself included, want to be able to use any device of our choice within the enterprise. Now, if you think about the information that's being created, just take a, take a different, they're accessing information through those devices because that makes them more productive. The mm -hmm. bulk of the information today is created by individuals, mm -hmm. but managed by corporations. So, the panel earlier was talking about what do you do with all that information that's, that's, that's created and, 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 and lives within your organization. I think that, that is where the enterprise focuses on, mm -hmm. of the, the, the information and how you bring, drive value out of it. What the, what the consumerization, if you would, uh, on the individual is, hey, I want to use that information on this device. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, a, in my mind, it's coming together of, the, you know, of, of that sort of a, uh, inflection point, if you would. Mark, did you think about... Yeah, Please. And, and, and uh, well, there's something that you know we we've uh, been working on internally, um, you know, in innovation and um, in, in uh, at VMware, we have a thing we call the Alpha Lab, and we work closely with with R and D, and they um, have a new thing that's called Horizon, and this is a more of a portal which has that you know really nice interface, you know, to um, to the end user. It deals with all the identity, and then we have all the different applications. So it um, the 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 thing that's uh, nice about this is then you can use it on any device. So you can use it on the iPad, you can use it on the laptop and so forth. So I think it, it just kind of gets back to, I mean, I'm gonna use the device of my choice, I've gotta get to all these apps, and if you, can, if you can make the interface a little easier and maybe only have me log in once and so forth, I mean, I think we're moving in that, uh, in that, in that generation. But we've got to figure out how we remove, remove all the friction. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, w within IT, there's just so much friction. You've got log into this system or mm -hmm. log into this system. No, you can't have that device. And sorry, this application doesn't work. And we don't transfer data. We've got to remove all that. We've got to make it much easier because, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that in, in the... Uh, consumer world, it's easier. They collaborate. There's no training. There's no manuals. You just sit down and you use it. We've got to drag that into the enterprise. And you know, just as an example, this, this Horizon project that we have is a step towards that. The mm -hmm. whole store where you, here's the apps that you can, you, you know, by your role that you're able to get to. It keeps track of them. You log in once. That's what we've got to do. Now, is that something that you're doing broadly across the organization? Or are you using a certain set of early adopters to pilot that concept? Uh, it, it, the intention is broadly, but we mm -hmm. started off with like in the CRM space and then the our HR system. So those were some of the ones that we, we rolled out, but my intent is to get that across all of our applications. Okay, okay. The only thing, David, if I could, the only thing I would add in terms of, you know, thinking about this technology at the enterprise versus the individual contributor level, being this is a CIO conference, one of the things that we're actively looking for in terms of benefits as we continue to use these technologies um, is I, I, don't, I don't want server administrators, okay? Mm -hmm. I, they're wonderful people. I, I don't want database administrators. I don't want mainframe. Yeah, I, I, I really want functional analysts. You know, I want people that understand the business. I want my IT department to be seen as increasingly as a partner and to be conversant in, in, in the terms that are important to the business. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would just offer the audience, you know, that's yet, 
in a, there's enterprise, there's individual contributor, and then there's your IT tower, mm -hmm. okay? I think a view of how you wish to transform the skill sets in that tower and redeploy them is also something that's very useful. It's, it's, it's helped us. That's a fabulous point. So let's go there. I mean, as you think about the future of IT and you think about the, the skills and capabilities that can be required inside the organization, regardless whether they exist in something called right. IT today versus elsewhere in the enterprise, um, what are the new skills, what are the new roles that are being created and enabled by the cloud and mobility? Sanjay? It's, it's a topic I'm, I'm passionate about because I think this is an incredible opportunity for IT professionals. The, sort of the, the point we're at in, in, in the industry um, allows you to sort of redefine how we do things. So one of the conversations I'm sure my, my peers here would agree, but one of the, one of the most uh, frequent conversations we have with our bright investors is where does my career go? Mm -hmm. what, what's next for me? What skills do I need to apply myself to so oh, I can no. move up to the next thing, whether it's an individual contributor or a management role? And for years, you've had very well-defined IT tracks, and, and you know, that's it. Now, we're picking on our, uh, on our brightest and best and saying, we don't know how this, this is going to work. What's a, you know, I didn't have a cloud architect two years ago. Right. We have cloud architects today. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and this is an unconventional role where you're looking at everything from infrastructure to applications all together, including operations. And you're breaking down the traditional IT silos. And Get rid of the friction. And, and the friction. And so that's one example. Um, you know, cloud architects, data center architects, service managers. To Anthony's point earlier, you know, these are business managers right. that are now like pre-sales consultants, if you would, mm -hmm. not that's project exactly right. managers. So again, you can go this way with the business, conversation, and you still need to go this way with the technology because now you're provisioning for the enterprise, not mm -hmm. just for an application, but it's incredible opportunity. Yep. Well, I agree with that. It, it does definitely requires both the business and also understanding technology and complexity of the technology. And, uh, and you know, the, the line between IT and the business in some cases is crossing over. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have IT resources, you know, more in the business side and vice versa. So the role is going to continuously to change and it has to be whatever is the best for the business in order to move forward. It's a very interesting analysis that we had done. We had about 5,000 knowledge workers to understand what was um, most important from an information standpoint in order to enable their productivity to drive essentially a 25% bump in um, performance um, from these knowledge workers. And you found that information attainability, the usefulness of that information, and then their capability um, were the three things that you needed to have. And the vast majority of IT initiatives that have failed information management initiatives you can look at and say, we had one, we had three, we missed two. Or we had two and we had one, but we didn't have three, the knowledge worker capability. When you think about the data analyst role and some of the data scientists, uh, Sanjay, that we were talking about before, a very interesting thing came out of that analysis which showed that those individuals, it's more important that they be able to coach individual knowledge workers on how to use the information than they necessarily have particular um, uh, uh, super skills themselves to access the information. It's the coaching and the scalability of getting that mm -hmm. knowledge out to the broader enterprise that turns out to be much, much more important. So as you think about folks in the IT organization today or elsewhere in the organization that you want to bring in, um, you know, probably, what, 85% of the things that will be done in IT in the future don't require a great knowledge of technology per se within the enterprise. Certainly within external service providers and cloud providers, there'll always be a role for technologists. But within the organization, you know, the, the term you were talking about, the end of the monopoly, for me it's always been the breakdown of the guild of IT, right? Mm -hmm. What we used to know and had access to was super special and you had to come to us, mm -hmm. and it's just not true mm -hmm. anymore. And so how you figure out how to bring the new skills that are going to make your organization successful, and how do you figure out how to engage the broader organization in effective conversation turns out to be very, very important. Well, I'd never want to disagree with, with, with the moderator because you never know what kind of question he's going to follow up but with. But go right ahead. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as optimistic as 85%, but I, I, I definitely agree with the logic stream. I, I would say that with this movement, there are new inherent challenges, and a number of things that we have learned, for example, application performance management in a mainframe or a distributed computing environment, we had taken for granted because of the hardening and the maturity of tools. You know, we move that or a similar application into a cloud environment, suddenly these individuals that we're talking about, 
you know, there's, there's a need for them to understand the platform, the network, the application itself, as opposed to the training from that one particular vendor and mm. then, you know, the, 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 the go-do behind that. So, you know, and again, these things will mature. There's lots of tools and there's lots right. of products out there, but it's not hardened yet. So. Mm. So, mm. Fair point. Because I, I think some of the things that um, you know, our, our new leaders um, in, in IT really have to think about, I mean, one is just to be um, really embracing change because change is constant. I mean, mm. that's what we do. We're change agents in an organization. We're constantly coming up with st stuff, although sometimes we reinvent it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, really good communicators I, it, is good because we can often get you know, enamored in the technology and so forth, but that's, that's, that's something. And I think it's, it's just that consultative business skills. Right. Those are really hard because I don't know how many of you out there have too many business analysts. Any, anybody? You know, please give me your business cards. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, um, you can never find enough really that's good right. business analysts that understand that, that, that business side. So, and I don't think that's going to go away. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll be abstracting more of the technology, focusing on applications, but just that, that, that hand Shake, you know, with the business is, is, is very important. And I guess the, the last thing that I would say is just architects. And, and, and if anybody has any, you know, spare architects, let me know about that as well. <laughs> but, um, you know, like somebody who can really look across an enterprise architect are very, very hard to find. Yes. You know, somebody who can span okay. all the different devices and technology and so forth. So I don't think that's going to go away. And I think those are kind of broader, kind of softer skills. But, but I think that's, that's where I think that we have to, you know, really build those up because they're, they're, it takes time, you know, to get those skills. And, and um, I think they'll always be in, in demand. I, yeah, I, I think the complexity actually in the beginning will get worse instead of getting better, mm. right? Yeah. Because, you know, if you somehow you start a new company and you move everything to the cloud and you say, all right, I will manage it that way. Reality is we do have existing infrastructures. We're using some of the, the cloud technologies and so on. So we have to manage all of that. And, and that becomes complex. And having the resources to fully understand that, you know, it's a, probably a challenge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So now with time, you know, things will definitely get easier, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not going to be, you know, as easy as we think. How do you build those change agents, though? What are the things that we need to do as IT leaders to identify folks with that set of communication uh, capabilities, that sort of ability to think holistically, to understand the, the needs of the business? And then how do we bring out those qualities? Mm -hmm. I think... I think I think the, the, uh, the folks in the organization that want to do more, mm -hmm. you know who they are, right? They're always coming at you saying, hey, I want to be able to do more of this and more. But traditional IT constructs haven't permitted necessarily, whether it's organizational or functional, haven't, allowed, you know, allowed it, ha haven't made it easy to move mm -hmm. across. With, with this sort of cloud architecture, if you would, we can break those things down. Mm -hmm. And, and you, can really, you can really pick from within the organization some of your bright and best, Give them a little room to, to make mistakes because mm -hmm. the script hasn't been written yet, mm -hmm. to Anthony's point. It hasn't been hardened yet. And you're going to pick a tool, you're going to pick another tool. It may work, may not work. You know, you, you've got to give them a little iteration time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it will surface. Mm -hmm. And, and um, we, have, we have the office of the uh, chief architect, and, and, and he essentially um, is sort of the spiritual leader for, for our architectural team and brings them, you know, it doesn't matter if they're a messaging architect or they're in operations or some other part of the business. Mm -hmm. The goal is to cross-skill our architectural team, and and um, you know it does. But you have to invest in it. You have to, you have to really get behind it. I, I would, if I could, I would offer that it's it's equal effort to take someone, and I think you were touching on this, David, and nurture them beyond you know their own domain expertise into a chief architect role. It's equally difficult to do that as it is to bring in you know someone either in your organization or from outside your organization and expect in a very short period of time to understand not only your individual applications, but why those applications are the way they are today, okay? I.e. the business process associated with them. So, you know, it, our approach has been, and, and Sanjay put his finger on it, you know who those people are, okay? And all of us have HR policies that we hopefully should follow. You know, you nurture those people, you retain them, you give them the, the stretch experiences. And then um, when there is uh, one thing that we've used, when there is a need to go external, mm. we use cross-functional interviewing. I find that some of the worst candidates that have come to me for reasonably senior jobs, 
you know, they hadn't been into the business. They hadn't been into the people that are consuming the output of IT. So cross-functional interviews. And then the last thing I heard on the, CI, uh, the CEO panel this morning, mm -hmm. and I'm going to adopt this. I had ne never done it before, which is um, to interview the person before you read the resume. Right. So you would assume that HR is sending you someone that's, okay, but interview them first. And, and I, the light bulb went on, and I think that that is a darn good idea. So I'm going to add that to the repertoire as well. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're coming to that point in time where we'd like to invite the conversation to extend um, into the audience. And if there are questions or qu uh, questioners who would like to come up, there's two microphones here at the front. Um, we will uh, we'll bounce back and forth like we did before. Um, we are very focused, as mentioned before, on the questions of how you're extracting value of kind of the softer skills and how you think about the people aspects and then innovation, but of course we'll be interested in, in all questions. Please, sir. Hello? Yes. Uh, sorry if I be um, It was a point that uh, Mr. Tsakas uh, made about uh, we won't put our customers' application to run in the cloud. That's intriguing me because that's what we want to break, this fear that maybe doing that in the public cloud is not the right place. Of course, there are other issues how to judge to put in the public, but this one shouldn't be one, I think, because mm -hmm. otherwise we're not going to adopt the public clouds. Right. So information and how we think about what we're comfortable having in the public cloud versus right. the private cloud. Can we push our thinking further there? Uh, yeah, at this point, you know, what we, we are offering in terms of uh, Iron Mountain is a trusted uh, partner, and we do have our own uh, kind of uh, secure facilities where we, you know, we have most of our customer, you know, we have all of our customer data. So this is part of, you know, of the services that we offer to our customers. So at this point, we have moved into, you know, to an outside public cloud. Can I take a shot at that? I guess Please. The comment I would make is, you know, we, we've been putting uh, payroll data, you know, in the cloud. You know, it's a, you know, ADP is a cloud provider, right? Uh, for four <laughs> years. You know, so I mean that's awfully sensitive information. So I think it, you know, the the it, it will mature, and it's really based on your company. I mean, how comfortable right. are you with what you do in house versus a third party? But I don't think that this is anything necessarily new. In in the in the the whole market will mature, and, and it's really up to your business where you are and so forth that you'll be comfortable with it. So I don't think that there's an answer as to when because we've been doing it for 40 years. Mm. Anthony. Well, I mean, the, the screen that we use is, you know, why can't you put it there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a more general set of questions, something that requires extreme performance, right? If the application is going to take 100% of a server, why the heck am I going to, right? You know, also specific data location applications, right, where there are specific customer requirements, you know, Mark's comments notwithstanding, there are things that customers prescribe. So we're quite customer focused in that regard. <laughs> but, no, <laughs> but not fear. Not fear. Very good. We'll go to a question on the left, please. Thank you. My name is Linda Pelikudas. I'm the Principal Managing Partner of Strategy and Design Solutions. My question for the panel is this. As we're extending into the area of security, when you think about security, what are your thoughts about role-based credentialing of people and devices and the, the impact that that's going to have? How do, do you use this in your organization? And how have you implemented if you have? If you haven't, what are your thoughts about the importance of doing this? So role-based credentialing, where we want to start. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to do um, role-based. I mean, it, it's just not possible, you know, the individual. So I think that's, that's clearly the, the area that you want to, uh, the approach, you know, is, is, is by role. And then, you know, based on that role, you know, what information can you, you access and so forth. But, but I, I clearly um, feel that's the direction that um, we, have to, uh, we have to take. And, and um, it's all about protecting the data. I mean, I think we've given up on kind of the, the moat, you know, around the, you know, the castle and all that sort of thing. So I think it's more now, what is the critical data in your enterprise? How do you make sure that that's as secure as possible and then only authorized folks can, can get to it? But, but um, you know, there's just to too many ways to get in the castle today. It's pretty porous. So is this something that you're doing already or yes. is it something that you're moving towards? Yeah, we do role-based. Okay. As do we. Seeing a lot of nodding heads up here. I would, I would uh, want to follow on question to that, though, which is this question of, you know, 
what is the true IP in the organization, the, the most important information, and putting, putting the regulatory challenges to the side for just a moment, do you believe that our business partners would say it's 2x, 3x, 4x, what it should be? Do we need to push ourselves further there in saying to the point that the academic panel was making before that it isn't the information that is critical, it's how we use the information, um, and therefore we need to be comfortable with breaches in certain areas or, or having that information be more publicly available, less narrowed to a limited set of folks who might have the roles to, uh, to work with it? I mean, push this, our thinking this, there. This, this types of information, you have to categorize information. All information is not the same, right? Um, I think the panel ahead uh, prior to us was really delving into the areas of big data. How do you, how do you mm. better utilize all that wealth of information that you have? It, it, it's not monetized if you don't use it. Right. So it's really, you know, how do you monetize some of that information for the better, you know, for your organization, for your enterprise? Um, but on the surface, all information is the same, and you have to, you have to know what the crown jewels are and what, what is important to you, what is regulatory, what isn't, mm -hmm. and, and segment your information uh, and your approaches based on that. Mm -hmm. So profile, posture, those things all play into that. But you could find a very interesting dynamic of, of putting the bit of the role-based um, approach that was just being described with also the information having metadata Absolutely about right. it, and it's the merging of those two that's going to get us to where and we location. need to be. And location. Yeah. And possibly... Because of devices, you have to know, is this coming from the right place, or the right device, to the right types of information on the right profile? So you've got to mix all that stuff together. Excellent. Excellent. And, and the data, uh, Please, Mark, go ahead. And then we'll come. I mean, that, that's a lot of work. I mean, we would like to say all the information is super secret, and, you know, it's, it's very uh, expensive, you know, to put all those controls, so you've got to prioritize that. Mm -hmm. But I'll just say, like, at a software company, it would be RIP. I mean, RIP is, is, is all around software, if you will. Let's say you're in, you know, maybe financial services, it, it, you know, credit cards, those sorts of things, but, but you have a, it, it does narrow. You, you can't necessarily put all the controls in around all your data. You, you've got to stack rank that. Right, right. Well, right. as you think about sort of DR, would you like more DR? Yes, please. Are you willing to yeah. pay for it? Let's talk. Right. Please. Hi, uh, Bruce Hord, and I'm editor of Virtualization Review, and my question is, how important is it to be proactive with cloud initiatives, and what competitive business advantages can CIOs realize for their companies if they move quickly, or is this not so much about competitive advantages as much as it is just optimizing your IT infrastructures and letting the cards fall where they may? Okay, so is this a, is this a source of advantage for the enterprise and there's some first mover um, value to be had here, Sanjay? I, I, you know, I, I think that um, getting on this journey, I mean, I'm, again, hindsight, so I'm looking back and saying what we did looks really smart now because we got onto it early and, and we took the noise off the table about you know, classic business IT decisions. What do we run this on? What do we manage this with? What skills do we need? Single points of failure. We kind of took a lot of that off the table and hopefully our driving business advantage by being able to really drive solutions and, and um, for our business quicker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the turnaround time becomes quicker. So we, we started with that, with that, you know, is it agility or is it, is it efficiency? Uh, in this day and age, I, I mean, I'd, be, I'd challenge anyone not to have efficiency top of mind. So it is, it is right there, but you have to get beyond that quickly, right. mm -hmm. uh, and that's agility. So I would say that uh, I would completely endorse that line of thinking. And I would add, and I would add to that, the second you get away from uh, you know, the infrastructure as a service world, and I'm not trying to mitigate the importance of that at all, but you know, whether, it's, whether it's communications as a service, whether it's platform as a service, and you start to go into those areas which are burgeoning right now, they're just emerging, um, I absolutely believe that these other items around computing that we've been talking about are quite foundational that can extract huge value for your enterprise in those other areas. Excellent. Absolutely. Excellent, excellent. Question from the left, please. Hi, Tom. Uh, hello? Is there... there you go. Oh. <laughs> okay. Tom Corey, CEO of uh, Persistence Incorporated. Assuming you've racked and stacked your applications that you want to move into the cloud, do you see an evolution of the process by which that happens? Absolutely. In other words, uh, do you build SOA layers first? Do you develop agile teams? I mean, speak to the mechanics of how do I go from here to here? So. Okay. Um, who would like to take that from the panel? Uh, Tasso, I, I, start with I you. I can, uh, can go on that. As, um, in terms of um, applications, we, we have looked in terms of uh, CRM applications, you know, HR applications, e e e ERP applications for a small uh, places. I think it's, um, you know, I go back into the previous questions. I think you have to be proactive because you have to move your team through it. You know, the change is going to come, mm. right? So you have to evolve your team and you have to move them and grow them that way. 
because otherwise you may be, you know, by the time, you know, you get there, you may be a little bit late, mm. right? So I have been challenging my team in terms of moving into that space and leveraging some of the new technologies and innovations in that. But uh, many more of the internal applications, that, those are some of the things we're moving first. Any other thoughts on that point? Before I, I think forward? it's really hard to, if, if you're a developer today, and, and unless you folks found something that my team and I haven't, it's really hard to future-proof applications that are written for the cloud, and that goes back to the standards discussion that we've had. Mm -hmm. So a lot of work that's being done around that. So when you talk about racking and stacking your applications and being able to port them, I think there's two dimensions to that question. Um, one of them is, and you touched on it, it's the business process associated with that because that fundamentally changes. Mm -hmm. We have found that, that, I mean, take security, for example, the walls come down, you better be really sure about the business process associated with you know, a transaction um, that needs to be secure, right? But, you know, I just go back, I go back to the point on standards again. It's very hard to do this in the environment as it exists today. It will be overcome, it will happen, you know, 18, 24, 36 months, but right now it's difficult. Excellent, excellent. Stage right. Hey. John DeWitt from the MITRE Corporation. We, um, we run very traditional security operations where we monitor every packet coming into the company, um, monitoring uh, exchange of information, and we actually store that for up to a year, depending on uh, history around that time when we mm -hmm. collected the, the capture. So once we moved to virtualization, there was a different set of security problems that you, know, you have to address. Now based on the cloud, if I have a device, a lot of hardware that I use to monitor traffic, what would be the normal progression for cloud? Um, one idea would be, say, to split traffic that goes into cloud application, one application running on one piece of virtualized hardware to a second piece. Now there's a special protocol or you know, communication between the clouds. Now how do you address that when, say, a company wants to monitor all traffic in between every computer, <laughs> even on the cloud? I know it's a, a big data and a, a pipe issue, but um, how would you address that for the companies that are used to the, I've got a piece of hardware that's connected to the copper? Yeah. Yeah. versus you know, out on the cloud where you have no idea where the actual machine is. So, I, so I've got the challenge of security, and I've got sort of a, I don't want to say an old world view, but I've got a, a, a view that understands sort of physical infrastructure, right. and now I'm moving into a, into a virtual world. Um, is, this a, is this about technical solutions? Is this a, we need to change our way of thinking? How do we address that challenge? Sanjay, maybe I'll start with you. Okay. If you would. <laughs> because you looked over my, here, sir. I was, I was about to say my chief architect's in the audience. He can answer that. <laughs> but... Uh, it's a little of both. I mean, you know, the way, the way I've been, not being an expert necessarily in the subject, but being what I've heard across the process as we've gone through this is you don't lose your good, good hygiene habits from physical to virtual. That's right. Okay, so you carry them forward. Technologies will evolve. And in fact, virtualization will probably give you a, a deeper level of instrumentation that you didn't have in the, in the physical world. Mm. So that you could, you could, you know, but it will evolve. Now, I guess the, the bit I'd, I'd close with on that is, in this, in, in, this, in this cloud world, it's, you know, security has to be built in, not bolted on. Mm -hmm. in, in the world we came from, every time there was a vector that was exposed, Mark said it was, it's porous, you'd block the vector, or you'd do something about it. So more, more feeds, more instrumentation, it just kept growing. You've got an ability with cloud to really build the security in at the information layer, and really look at the information assets as opposed to just the, as opposed to just the physical assets. Right, so right. The, or, the, or the vector assets, you know, the vectors. So that's how we're, you know, again, not being an expert, I don't want to well, misstate things, but that's sort of the philosophy, if you would. Uh, standards aren't the catch-all, but, you know, you look at IEEE, P2301, P2302, gets to the heart of your question. How was this thing built, and how do you connect to it? Right? So standard templates and service structures around that that create an industry taxonomy that you can talk about right, in a common language. That's, that's the underpinnings of what that standards movement is. Again, it's not the, that's not the catch-all, but that is what that is geared towards. I completely agree with everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go stage right and then stage left. Okay. Uh, Mark Dunman, general manager of a cloud billing company called Matanga. Uh, my question is a little bit more back towards the standards, specifically in the area of uh, public clouds and SLA. It seems that historically, uh, when you own the stack, you had a very good sense of what SLAs were. Mm. Now it seems that as we're adding uh, 
a lot of keys to the stack. You don't really own the stack anymore. There's many components to the technology. Um, getting SLAs all the way through the stack on the public side seems to be an area that a lot of people are tripping over right now and is somewhat slowing adoption. Um, it seems to be an industry issue where someone either has to, there has to be a standards body to resolve that or someone has to step up and take the lead on that. I'd love to hear you know, the panel's thoughts on how we resolve that type of issue. So as we think about sort of the services and, and a service SLA um, versus OLAs at the various levels of the stack um, and, and recognizing the standards, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if there's, uh, there are other, other approaches or ways people are thinking about it. Mark, is this uh, one that yeah, well, would be in your bailiwick? I'd say, you know, anytime you buy a service on-premise, off-premise, SaaS, you know, uh, and so forth. I mean, you, you, you're going to have to, uh, you know, uh, evaluate that. So I don't know that you would necessarily give a public cloud provider uh, any more slack than you would ha someone that you're using a service in internally. So I think the same kind of rules apply, you know, in this. And, and right. um, you know, what we, what we try to do is when we, ha when we figure out, you know, what are the kind of projects or business problems or whatever we're, we're, we're going to solve, I mean, if, if I can get a service, I mean, that's kind of the first of choice. If I can't get a service and then let's say I buy it, and if I can't buy it, I build it. But I kind of go across that, um, you know, that spectrum. But I think that, um, you know, it, it's maturing. You know, it's an area that will, it's just going to mature over, over time. But I don't think that um, the, the market's going to drive it. Right? So if you don't provide a good enough service level, if you will, we're not going to bother moving it out there. We're not going to sign up for that. So I think that the whole market and economics will, will, will drive the market, and, I, and, and we'll get there. I mean, I, I think that you know, there's, there's good examples of services out there that have excellent you know, kind of SLAs and so forth, and then the ones that don't, I mean, they're just not going to compete. I'm just going to say, you know, I, I, as we went through the process and I continue to go through the process, one of the exercises that we, we, we invested in, if you would, was baselining. What do we provide internally today? Right? Some of these applications have been around a long time. What is the true SLA that we've got versus what we provide? Right. Um, and then, to be fair to where you're going to, whether it's public or even private, it doesn't matter. You have to, you have to, you have to pragmatically baseline what, what you're doing. And with, when you're moving to cloud, you then have the ability of being able to really say, what level of service are you willing to pay for? as opposed to, uh, here's what I gave you because that's what the budget you had, or here's what we think we were working with. So it gives you a little more visibility into, right. into what you've been coming, where you're coming from to where you're going to, and you can have that honest conversation with the business where you say, now you decide what level of service you're willing to pay for in this new brave world versus what we, we, we thought we had between us. I'd say it applies private or public. Mm -hmm. um, just public, you, you know, you have, you, some, you're just dealing with an outside person or entity, really. That's 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 how, how we're putting. Have the conversation about what is the service level you think you have, versus what you think you want to pay for. Excellent. Thank you. Stage left. Good afternoon. My name is Brian St. Andre. I'm a strategy advisor for Booz Allen Hamilton. And my question for you is, uh, if you were trying to advise a customer who is not utilizing the cloud at all today, and they are not motivated by money. Uh, and they are extremely... Would be a governmental organization. <laughs> <laughs> I won't speak about my clients. Uh, however, if they're not extremely motivated in terms of cost savings, and they're extremely motivated uh, about security, and they're skeptical about reliability, how would you advise them? I, I guess I would go back to, do they care whether they move fast or not? I mean, you know, if there's an agility, so if they don't care about money and they don't care about, um, you know, the, the, you know, insecurity is, is an emphasis. I just go back to that speed. Is there a desire to move faster, to get more done and so forth? I mean, that's sort of a, a, an angle. I, I can't imagine that they're getting more done than they want to, you know, in a, in a given week. But it, I think that's a question that I would pose. It, it, it depends on their needs, you right. know, and depends what their security needs and so on is, you know, uh, depending, I will advise the, the IT team if they're doing any kind of development to start using some of the cloud resources for their development needs so they can be very agile at it. And maybe, you know, they will get uh, more using those services when they feel more comfortable with that. You know, and the security probably on, on certain applications will be different needs versus others. Brian, I'd also ask them to simply say, what do your customers want you to do? And, and, and ask that in a time series, not just today, but looking forward. And how, how would you speak to 
the reliability of cloud versus individual IT silos? I, I mean, we, you know, I'd say in retrospect, private cloud. Um, right. Reliability, gone up. Yeah. You're, you're standardizing. Yeah. Uh, you're, you know, you've, you've got less single points of failure, better reliability. So, you know, done right, um, that, that's, not a, that's not contentious. Anybody have a, anything contrary with that experience where there's been less, less quality of service? Not once Private. you work the kinks out, yeah. Once you work the kinks out, right. given the transformation challenges. Very good. Final question. Judy Reed Smith, CEO of Atlantic ACM. In some of our uh, searchings, we have found that people say that CIOs are, tr are buying more dark fiber uh, in a quest for control. And, and I wonder, it seems as if it would add so much more complexity that I wonder if it's control of cost or control of security or, you know, what control of their job. <laughs> 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 what would be the motivations? And do you think that that is a trend? I missed the first part of the question. Oh. So dark fiber, CIOs buying more dark fiber in quest of control, trying to understand what type of control and whether or not that might be a trend that we're seeing that might be driven by the cloud. I'll, I'll take a shot at it, um, <laughs> Judy. Uh, so it's my industry. Um, I think, I think uh, it's, it's not, not to make a generalization, but it's an effort in many respects to future-proof an infrastructure. Okay, with the growth of a number of, 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 of some of these transactional-based applications, the need to continually upgrade the plumbing, as it were, can become very burdensome. So there's a very easy cost-benefit analysis to do at the outset, and you know, my, my, my sense would be that's part of the driver. So potential, potential future requirements uh, translating into control, but not necessarily uh, anything beyond that. Thank you. Thank you. Here's what I'd like to do um, to, to bring us home. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, you know, the, the beauty of this panel was that you had the practitioners up here who might be a, a bit further along in driving internal activities in their organizations than, than all of us are. Um, we'd like to learn from successes, and we've talked about a lot of those successes. I'm not going to ask each panelist to say what's your greatest failure, um, although that did come up in dinner last night as a great way of thinking about this. But I would ask you to think, what's the greatest lesson you've learned? Mm -hmm. So if you were to take away one idea, one thing from your experiences in the cloud to date, um, what would it be? Um, and uh, Anthony, I started with you, Satasos. With your, with your permission, I'm going to start with you this uh, time. Yeah. Uh, so the, the lesson I learned is um, I, I had applications both in, in the cloud and also very similar applications in, uh, you know, in, uh, in our hosted environment. And when I looked into that, it, was, you know, it became significantly more expensive for me. So in some cases, I had to come back and, and combine them and, and reduce my cost. And in some cases, I moved it out of the cloud just because I had the existing infrastructure. Okay. So not everything is you know, one way or another. So look for the rationalization possibilities that might exist as you move forward. And exactly. it's not clear that you're always moving to the cloud. Find the right home. Yeah. Sanjay. So I guess I'd say that sometimes the, um, the bits move faster than our ability to digest them. Mm -hmm. OK, and so you know, it's, it's, things are moving so quickly in this, in this space that it, it pays to take two steps forward and maybe half a step back, reacclimatize, make sure you know what you've done you know, in the phase that you're just coming out of, because technology changes, processes mm -hmm. change, people need to change. So let's make sure we, you know, we don't keep rushing forward because of the next cool set of bits that just showed up. Um, you know, it's just, I think there's a lot of compression in, in, in how fast things are showing up at our door. So mm -hmm. that's sort of what we, it's a conscience check, you know. Ch change is a requirement, but progress is optional, so consolidate your gains. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Absolutely, great. Please, Mark. Uh, I, I would say on the organizational side, um, I, I think that um, the staff you have today is not necessarily the staff you need in the future. So you want to figure out, you know, what are those skill sets? You know, what are the things that you want your staff to focus in um, in the future? And how do you get there? Um, you know, if you think about it as, as a CIO, how much do you really control and manage and so forth day in and day out? So one of the things that um, you know, I've tried to sign up for is, is just that whole training side of, of, of um, IT. And I'm behind it, and I'm supporting it, and so forth. But we have two tracks, a technical track and a management track. So I'm 
trying to figure out how I get my staff to kind of where they need to be in the next year or two to, to you know, kind of embrace and, and take advantage of all the changes that are going on in the, uh, you know, environment. And, and I, 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 would, I would say as you get higher in the organization, there's less things you really influence and control. But I think training and staff development is something that we can all take on. Excellent, excellent. Anthony, final words to you, sir. I, I promise I'm not going to mention standards again on this one, but um, I, I would say, I would say um, uh, very clearly, don't assume the network's going to be there. Okay. Uh, in addition to what, 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 what the gentleman have just said, don't assume it's going to be there. And I can tell war stories, and I won't, about how perfectly we planned certain deployments within locations and took our eye off the ball in terms of what happens between those locations. So don't assume the network is going to be there because you don't know, you know what else is happening in those offices with those lo local, uh, local area networks and when there's going to be another royal wedding that people are going to stream and then turn around and say it was your application, you know, when in fact it was the network. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all. Thank you for a lively discussion, lively debate. It was great fun.